Good morning, guys. Well, welcome to a, another edition of Purgatory Ironworks here. And today I've got some pretty cool things for you. Uh, today we're actually going to be making one of our dinner bells. Now, a lot of people always ask, uh, what are great sellers at festivals and whatnot? Well, let me tell you, the dinner bell is something that we do a tremendous number of, and they're pretty easy. Now, one of the things that I don't think I've done a lot of in the videos is I haven't used a lot of the tooling that we have here in the shop. A lot of the demos I have done, I have tried to do with a minimum of tooling because you may not have the specialty tools in your shop, you know, because a lot of you guys are just getting started. Today, we're going to kind of ease and transition into a little bit more of what we actually do here in the shop and how we do it. So I'm going to be giving you a sneak peek of some of the jigs that we use because if you're going to make any money at all doing blacksmith work, you're going to have to run jigs, period. Um, I, there's a problem with folks that just get into the, the craft. You can always pick them out. They call them button uh, uh, stitch counters. Uh, the uh, costume Nazis, they are people that want to be rabidly authentic. That's fine. Uh, you can do that. Just don't expect to make any money. Uh, you're going to have to run jigs in order to uh, be able to produce enough to sell things. The reason that blacksmiths don't exist in their previous form is because industry beat the pants off of them. And they grew up and they became machinists and welders and everything else. Now, there's a happy medium in there. So we're going to be using some things like this, uh, which is a small bending jig. This is used on all of, oh my gosh, not just the dinner bells, but several of our tools as well. Uh, I believe this is an inch and a quarter piece that has a stop here. This allows us to do a quick, perfect curl on just about everything. The other tool that you're going to see is going to be this guy right here, uh, which is actually the bending jig for the dinner bell itself. And these are just, let me tell you, these are invaluable for getting good, consistent results. That's something that you want to keep in mind, consistency. Everybody gets lucky. I'm going to tell you a quick story about Jay, uh, which of course, if you don't know who Jay Reekert is, Jay Reekert was the man that taught me in Andersonville, Georgia. And I was trying to do this particular item in a month. I promise you, a month. Uh, I worked and worked until I had enough hammer skill. And I remember clearly the day that I got it right. And man, I was so excited and so proud. I run up to Jay and I said, Jay, man, check it out. I finally got it right. Man, it's right. Jay looks up and he strokes his little beard. He looks at it. He says, yes, this is indeed correct. And he turns to the window and throws the son of a gun out of the window. He says, now, go do 10 more just like it. I took offense to that. Uh, I took offense to that for, for quite some time. I was not a, exactly a happy camper. Uh, as I have gotten older and worked in the shop, I understand the absolute wisdom of what he did. Now, it was a rather harsh way to go about it, but the fact is, is you're not practicing this stuff to do one the right way. You're practicing this stuff so that you do a thousand this way. Uh, there, you know, there's all the internet memes, you know, the difference between a master and an apprentice is that a master has failed more times than the apprentice has tried. That's kind of really the situation here as well. So uh, jigs help that because you're going to do a lot of them. But anyway, the stock we're going to be using, we're going to be doing our kids' dinner bell, and we're going to be using some very simple one quarter inch hot roll round stock, which is stuff that looks like this right here. And this stuff is pretty good. I mean, it's just, a, this is pretty much a staple in the shop. We make all kinds of good stuff out of this. This will not only be the body of the bell, but we'll also take another piece and we'll make the clacker or the clanger for the bell as well. So the fire is hot. And we're going to take our time with this guy. We're really going to dress her up. We're going to make sure that she's completely hammer textured. So the first operation is we're going to hammer texture. Then we're going to put the hook in, and then we're actually going to bend it in the jig itself. So without further ado, let me get everything set, and let's go to work. Quarter rod does not take long to heat up. We have a good heat, and let's start our texturing. Now again, this rod is very, very thin, and you don't have to beat it to death in order for it to do what you want it to do. Now, 
The texturing is pretty subtle. We'll just work this guy all the way down, take our second heat, then flip it around and work this in. You'll be surprised at how subtle things make a tremendous difference in your finished piece. Uh, a lot of production blacksmiths will leave steel that it has you know, long stretches from the factory and they're very smooth and you can tell it immediately. Now for the majority of the population, nobody is going to pick up on that because they don't know anything about blacksmithing. However, if you do a piece that you've made sure that every surface area on there has a good hammer mark and good texture, it makes a difference in a higher quality product. A lot of people's not there yet, that's okay, but it's something to work towards. One thing I am going to do is work this to keep it straight. It doesn't have to be perfect, you just want to make sure that you try to keep it within reason. Now I'm going to need to flip this guy around, which means I'm going to need some tongs. Now it looks like we've got one more heat to uh, get this bad boy done uh, as far as the texture is concerned uh, and then we're going to work just the one end. We're going to draw a basic taper and we're going to make a hook on the end to start the dinner bell. Notice I'm not getting crazy aggressive with the texturing not having to kill it. I'm just breaking that factory finish. And that all to do it. So I'm going to cool this guy down and we'll go back into on this side. I just want to, you know, I, I'll, I don't like using the tongs unless I have to. So. And we still have the business hand to contend with. There we go. Right back into the fire. Now this next part's pretty much cut and dry. You've seen textures, uh, excuse me, you've seen tapers before. That's what we're gonna do. It's in quarter inch, so I don't care how much of a beginner that you are. Uh, tapering out a piece of quarter inch is not going to kill you in any shape, form, or fashion. The biggest issue people have with thinner stock is of course getting it too thin and rolling it into a rhombozoid. That's where instead of working it out in a square, it turns into a diamond and you get a fold and you get a coal shut. So, we're gonna avoid that. You can see there's our square taper, and now I'm going to round it. Again, with stock this thin, you don't have to murder it. You just have to tap it. Now that I've got this piece, I'm going to take one more heat, and then I'm going to take a pair of scrolling pliers, and I'm just going to go ahead and curl that tip. This is going to help me when I actually run it around my jig. Remember, be very careful with your heat with pieces this thin. It'll want to burn really quick. You see my scrolling pliers are just modified needle noses. Nothing special here. And there it is all cleaned up. You can see the tail bent. And now we're ready to talk about our jig. Guys, this, these jigs that we use in the shop, I mean, we, we do a ton of them. 
Uh, normally, I actually have sections of one inch hot roll bar, square bar, uh, that are act as jig bases, uh, you know, on hand and ready. As you can see, that's the one inch shank. Uh, just about every hardy hole in the shop, including the ones that we have in our table, are sized for this right here. So if we run into a situation that we need to make a new jig, buddy, I mean, zap, 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 and we're good to go. Uh, this particular jig is nothing complicated. It's some 3 8 plate, um, half inch square bar, and a piece of inch and a quarter round stock. These are all what you would consider drop pieces from any machine shop. I mean, this is the stuff that you would find in the scrap bin at places like that. However, I cannot begin to tell you the amount of money I have made on top of this little jig right here. So let's get a close up look at it. Let me show you what we're talking about here. Again, nothing terribly complicated. You have the shank, a base to keep it from falling through on the anvil. This piece is welded in and you have this stop. Now, according to the size that you're gonna be using, you know, that stop can be, you know, several different lengths between this piece and the stop itself. So for example, if you're doing really thick stuff, like this 3 8 it's not gonna do you a lot of good. So what you wanna do is, of course, have several of these tools made. Now for this, you can see that it will come right in here and catch very nicely on that quarter inch, and that's what we want. So now that everything is in place, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up a heat. Now normally if you were doing this freehand, you're gonna be there a while, but you're gonna see how quick and easy it is. Now I do have that little rat tail on the end, and this is a trick you need to learn. We're actually going to cool the rat tail because the rat tail itself is going to be very easily bendable if we bump it with the hammer. So this will actually help it catch, not damage the rat tail, but act as a base to bend the rest of the piece around. You'll see what I'm talking about here just in a moment. You can see the rat tail has been cooled. And we're just going to hook it in. And I really don't even have to smack it with the hammer until we get on around this way. And look at that, bam, that quick, and it is perfect. That's why you run jigs, folks. Straighten this guy up. And now I get to show you one other jig. But guys, this next jig's a little more complicated. It's a little beefier than the other one that you saw, but still pretty basic in its construction. You have your piece of one inch on the bottom, uh, another piece of plate, and then I have three eighths inch posts around the top, and I have this little alignment piece here that helps me with my catch. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop this in the hardy hole of the anvil back there. And again, you can see, you can clearly see where the three places you need to bend. Now, this is where we really cheat in the shop because you can use the furnace and heat that whole piece to make those bends, but you can make more accurate and controlled bends, especially on this thin stuff, using an oxyacetylene torch. But we're gonna use the forge today since most of you guys are not gonna have access to oxyacetylene. But let me put the disclaimer on there. If you wanna make these quickly, rapidly, and accurately, this is torch work. Again, one of the great things about using this thinner stock is that you can force it to do a lot of stuff when it's not exactly as hot as you need it. All right. She goes into our jig, just like this. She's gonna need to be held. And you can see my heat is off, so I'm not getting an even bend. In fact, I'm making a dog leg, but that's okay. I'm a professional, we can handle this. Okay, now, take a look at that. What a piece of crap, right? <laughs> All right, so again, this is why it's torch work. However, never fear, we can handle this. <laughs> it's been so long since I've done one of these freehand. This is, this is why I made a jig in the first place. But that's okay, check this out. And there you go. 
Now, what we're gonna do is I'm actually gonna set this down in the fire and now I can actually get that into the fire and we're gonna try that one more time. One of the great things about using a coal fire is that it has an open top. Now, if we were gonna to try to do that in a gas forge, unless we had a really big one, there's gonna be a problem. So let's, uh, let's put our jig back in here and let's do this right. There we go. There we have a good, accurate bend. And now, what we can do is we actually know exactly where this next heat needs to go. I'm actually going to put myself a mark there. Straighten her up just a little bit. Again, remember a lot of blacksmithing is more about coaxing than it is crushing. But there you go. There's your dinner bell. Okay guys, one last thing that we're going to do here is that if you have a dinner bell like this and you hold it with your fingers, it's not going to ring. You've got to suspend it by a piece of string, twine, cloth, something. And you can just put a loop on there, but when we go to our big shows, those loops come off and go everywhere. And though it's a little bit more of a time, what we start doing, what we have done, is we come in on this opposite corner here. We actually flatten that out, stretch it just a little bit, and we pop a hole in it. So what we're going to do is that very thing. I'm going to stretch this guy out, and we're going to punch a hole in here for a string for it to hang on. Now with something this small and this thin, always a little tricky. Your best option in this case is always to drill, take an eighth of this drill bit and just drill the joker and be done with it. Um, trying to hand punch it, especially by yourself, is tough. So understand, uh, as we're doing it, this is, not the, this is not the easy way. All right guys, here we go. Again, this is where you need a jig, you need a particular piece to be able to knock that plug out, you need a punch plate. Finally! Thank you, Jesus! You can see the plug's punched out, and now I'm going to clean up this disaster. And there you go. Let's scrub her and then cool her off. Now that she's cooled down, you know, she's not exactly straight or perfect or any of that. And you can take a little time over the heel of the animal and straighten her up if you want to. Never hurts to be, to have a nice presentation. Okay guys, there you go. What a, uh, what a bullfight. Uh, stretch that out just a little bit where, there we go. Uh, this is why we use jigs. So even somebody that's been doing this for a long time struggles with punching a hole if you don't have the right jig set up. Um, but there is your bell. So real quick, I'm going to make the clanger, which is really nothing more than another piece of quarter inch uh, with this hook on the end. So I'm just going to pop that in there real quick. And we'll do that. I'm going to find myself a little piece of string, we're going to hang it up, and we're going to see if this bad boy actually functions as intended. Okay guys, second verse, same as the first. Draw our taper. Take another quick heat and then make our curl.
There's the rat tail. One more quick heat. And just like before, we're going to cool the actual rat tail itself. Go all the way around. Bam, there you go. Okay guys, so here is our nice bell now suspended on a piece of string. Here's our clacker. Let's see if it functions as intended. It appears to function as intended, therefore this video is a success. Guys, uh, again, thank you so much for watching. Hope you got something out of this. Uh, remember, there are ways to go about this that you don't have to kill yourself. Jigs help tremendously. Uh, free handing always gives you a lot of experience. There's no two ways about it, but once you get the hang of it, make a tool for it. Guys, thank you for watching. Remember, make sure to like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your wife, tell your girlfriends. I'll see you guys later.